Thank you. Same to you. Uh, welcome to Holistic Conversations. Uh, we are absolutely happy and honored to have you with us. And uh, thank you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> you look so peaceful with your white dress. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, if white can do that, that's good. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Message for peace as always. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, uh, so uh, how should we start? I don't really know. I would like to know something about you, definitely. <laughs> okay. Um, would you like to know what I do? I think you know me mostly <laughs> as an artist. Yeah. I know some part of you, but not all. <laughs> Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you a bit more. Yes, please. I mean, uh, you can tell about your childhood and then you're coming to uh, Canada and then as much as you can let us know about yourself. <laughs> okay. So, I, uh, I'm of Indian origin, obviously. Wow. And, um, but I was born in Africa. So I was born in Uganda and um, I was brought up in Rwanda. Okay. Um, <coughs> hold on a second. You want something? Okay. No, on my end? Yeah. On my end, there's a, there's a burning smell. You want to go check? So, Please go. You can, you can, you can. Take your time, go and check. No, there's nothing happening here. Oh. <laughs> so I don't know. It's coming maybe from the neighbors or something. Oh, okay. Um, and we, we also, have, we've had a lot of uh, smoke oh. from fires oh. in northern BC. Yeah, I think we And from Washington State. Oh, okay. So 
that's probably what I'm smelling. <laughs> yeah, I was worried there for a minute. So yeah, I was. Uh, I grew up in a country called Rwanda in the center of Africa. I grew up in the capital city, uh, Kigali. And um, I was there until the age of 15. And then we had to leave. Um, so my family moved to Belgium after that, to Brussels. Oh, wow. Uh, which was a smooth, a smooth transition because um, Rwanda used to be a Belgian colony. Mm -hmm. So my upbringing was in that culture partly. I went to a Belgian school and uh, we stayed there for about a year or so and then my parents moved to Vancouver. Wow. Um, yeah, because my father's uh, brothers and stuff uh, had already moved here. Mm -hmm. So then we moved here and it was a huge transition for me because I didn't speak English at that time because I grew up speaking French and other languages. And so I've been here for many, many years now. And uh, in between, I went to live other places. I thought I'd be happier living in a French speaking environment. Oh, wow. uh, so I lived in Montreal. Uh, I lived in France for quite some time. And uh, with a short stint in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I came back here, so this is home now. Wow. <laughs> so what, what I understood from your experience is like, uh, you go away to feel that homely feeling and then you return back? <laughs> Yeah, I think when you when you go away, when you travel, uh, it takes you out of what you're accustomed to. Mm -hmm. So then you can discover other parts of yourself. Wow. Uh, but what I found is when you live in another place for a long time, um, it's the same old thing after a while. It's just you and you. <laughs> There's a, I think there's a famous uh, Buddhist book called Wherever You Go, There You Are. Yeah? Wherever you go, there you so, are. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, you know, you have to face yourself no matter yes. where you are. Yeah. Initially, it's all new and nice. Yes. Um, but in the end, um, the inner work is always there. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, is, yeah. that is the thing we return to, maybe. Yes, because that's where we that's where we find our true home, yeah. right? Inside of ourselves. Wow. Uh, yeah. Such a powerful but, message, you know, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like traveling and I like spending extended time in other places. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to continue doing that going forward. Um, I haven't gone anywhere for about ten years now. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Ten years you have been in that one city. Yeah, a little more than ten years, and then of course the last uh, few years with the pandemic. Oh yeah, we all stayed put. That's right. right? Yes, yeah. we did. We yeah. stayed home like never. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, <laughs> but then it was staying home. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, we, we got accustomed to every corner of oh our home. Oh my God, seriously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, our outer home and inner home. Mm. Yes, yes. I think that was a good time, which helped us to deal with ourselves a lot because we had no distractions. Yes, yes it was a bit like... Um, going on retreat, you know, in a cave. Yes. And um, sitting there. Yes. <laughs> day after day. That's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just give me one minute. I'm just going to close my window because all this smoke is coming inside. Sure, sure, please. Okay. Yes. Just give me one yes. minute. Yeah.
Okay, I'm back. Yeah. That should be better. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what else would you like to know? Yeah, I would like to know a lot about you. When I uh, well, yeah. looked into your profile, there's a lot of things that we can talk about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how did it all start? Ed? I mean, uh, your art and your, uh, you're a coach now, right? Yes, I'm, I'm a visual artist now and a somatic and creativity coach. And um, the, I've been doing artwork much longer than the coaching work. Yes, but, uh, so, please share some experience with us. We would love to know about, I think uh, mm -hmm. art is something we don't talk much about. Yes, that's true. I, we, yeah. I would like to know everything, almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> So in the background, you can see one of my paintings. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I paint uh, abstract paintings. Okay. And um, I like using abstract calligraphy. So this is gold and black with calligraphy on the top and calligraphy at the bottom. So this is calligraphy, right? Both top and bottom? Yeah. And yes. It's but it's abstract. It doesn't mean anything. Oh, but the the what do you say how do you define it how do you explain it what it looks like script oh yeah like the uh the, the top part for example a lot of people think it looks like arabic script i thought so i thought so <laughs> too yeah. yeah so that kind of comes uh, very naturally to mm -hmm. me uh so i started doing artwork uh, quite late in life okay. uh it's been about 17 years or so uh, but so before that um, I was doing things that I didn't enjoy very much um, I was a, a French English translator and when I studied that I really enjoyed it you know because the academic part is very different from real life so in real life I had to translate all kinds of things um, including inmate files and all that kind of stuff so I didn't really enjoy okay. it. and uh, I also trained as an accountant which was really not my <laughs> calling <laughs> I'm glad you said that so nicely sometimes mm -hmm. we need to know that that is not my calling that is not what I like yeah yeah, I kept on, uh, when I was at uh, UBC, you know, the, the university. Here, oh, yeah, that's so beautiful. I kept, on, I kept on switching. And at some point, uh, my parents said, you better finish one degree. <laughs> 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 so um, I did finish uh, a BA in French literature, okay. colonial French literature. And... Um, then I needed to do something more, you know, practical. So that's why I started accounting studies. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I could tell from the very beginning um, that I didn't belong there. Wow. Um, but they, my parents said, you better finish it. So <laughs> it, it was a long grind, but I finished oh, it. <laughs> great, great. That's really great. So... Somehow, though, when I finished it, and, you know, with decent uh, grades and everything, I just couldn't get a job. Every, all my classmates were, um, you know, articling with CA firms. I think now they call them CPA yeah. firms. CPA certified. And somehow, yeah, somehow I, I couldn't get in. Okay. And um, that's when it really occurred to me that this is not for mm -hmm. me. 
although I did uh, work uh, as an accountant and bookkeeper and all that for some time. Mm-hmm. Um, so how the artwork came to me is uh, uh, when I was growing up, um, one of our neighbors was this Japanese family. Mm-hmm. And um, I and my mother would often uh, visit. Okay. And uh, they had all this Japanese calligraphy, and Japanese art on the walls. Mm-hmm. I remember being quite taken aback by that, you know. And I used to say to my mom, can we just go to their house so I can see that again, you know. And she would say, well, we can't just go like that. <laughs> uh, so um, that kind of stayed with me. And once, um, once we were here, I finished my university studies. I saw this notice uh, to study with the Japanese um, Zen calligraphy master. Wow. And I, as soon as I saw the image, I just had to do it. Um, but it took a while because um, I registered right away. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she didn't have enough uh, enrollment, okay. so she canceled okay. it. And I, I was just uh, floored. Uh. <laughs> um, so I just kept on bugging her to offer it again and maybe in a different place. So eventually it happened. Mm-hmm. And I was able to study with her. And um, I didn't realize what I was getting into. Mm-hmm. Because it was really very demanding. Because oh. um, Zen calligraphy is uh, traditionally what Zen monks used to do as part of their um, spiritual practice. Um, it would usually involve taking one character, for example, the character for um, emptiness or enlightenment, and um, painting that character over and over and over again. So that's what it was like studying with her. She was very strict. Mm -hmm. And um, most semesters we would enroll and by the third class, about half the people would have left. (laughs) Mm. Uh, Because um, it was like a spiritual practice. It was very demanding. And if you had to take a break, she would think you're not committed, you know? Um, so, but I liked, I liked doing it, so I continued for a while with her. And then after a while, I just couldn't handle that kind of <laughs> strictness. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I left it alone and I started looking for other teachers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I studied with other teachers. Um, the longest I studied after that with another teacher was another Japanese teacher in Ottawa. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she was teaching at the uh, art school there. So I studied long distance. I would mail her my work and she would give me feedback. Wow. And I also went there once to study live with her. Um, and that was, that was a big influence on me. Uh, she came up with a method called um, the three B's, and that stands for breath, body, and brush. Breath, body, and brush. Brush. Yeah. Oh, you can see. So me. how to? Oh. Yeah. So how to harmonize all three? Yeah. It sounds like and, meditation um, to me. It is like that. Yeah. Yeah, because breath, yeah. body, and the way you move your brush, the rhythm. Yeah. Yeah, we had to, we we moved our body, you know, like you would in Tai Chi and stuff, yeah. you know, going forward, going backward. Um, so it's just a harmony of all those three. And um, one of the funny things I'll tell you, especially with the first teacher I had, um, is because I'm of Indian background, the expectations were huge. Oh, got you. It's like, you know, because uh, I guess. India Indians are perceived as culturally uh, being uh, well being well versed in meditation yeah. and all that right so she used to say oh well you're Indian so you know um, so it was a block I, I really? won't have I won't have any problems with you and I was like well <laughs> I'm not from India <laughs> not everything works out like that <laughs> yeah so you know she said oh you're Indian so 
um, you know, uh, you know how to be disciplined in your work and this and yeah. that. So I told her, I don't know if you've ever been to India, but it's pretty chaotic there. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're in a monastery. You know? yeah. yeah. So anyways, after that, I continued with artwork. Um, I joined an open studio mm -hmm. uh, with with a woman that I had met um, outside my local library and she was kind of a mentor and uh, so a bunch of us gathered every Friday afternoon and did our own thing and she would just help us out and so I, I studied uh, some of the Western art techniques uh, as well at that time uh, acrylic painting abstract painting abstract the whole movement of abstract expressionism, um, I really took to that. That's a form of freestyle painting that um, started in New York in the 1940s. Uh, and people like um, Mark Rothko, people like that are part of that movement. Um, so now my art is really a blend of the two. I still use, I still do some traditional you know, East Asian calligraphy painting uh, because it, it's really uh, a, it's really good to center myself and to find uh, a home within. And then the Western art uh, that I studied, um, the two together look a bit like the painting behind me. You know, it's gold and black. So most of my paintings have gold in them, and that must be the Indian background because I don't know why gold ends up in ev everywhere. <laughs> just give me one um, second, just give me one second. Ma, ma, ma! Is it full? Is it full? Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the art and I've just been continuing since. Yeah and learning a lot, uh, especially about uh, doing art professionally, you know, having to learn the marketing side of things. Oh, yeah. Uh, so marketing art is not like marketing any other object. No. Um, so it's quite a learning curve, even today. Yes, it is. And um, the coaching, um, one of the things that really attracted me about art making, especially uh, freestyle art making, was its healing power. You know, I, I was just thinking um, about that because you yeah. explained it uh, so nicely in a spiritual way. You know, like uh, breath, body, brush, and uh, the time and patience it takes to uh, perfect. It is. It is not perfect, but you act towards it, right? It's a process of like. Uh, it's, a, it's yeah. the process. It is a process. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. And you get to know yourself much better that way. Yeah, it is, I think it is uh, yeah. uh, very uh, reflective. I mean, uh, I just don't know how to explain. Like, uh, maybe you are meeting yourself very often. You know, you can see yourself <laughs> really, really like uh, focused on yourself. Like you can... Yes, and sometimes you don't really want to. Yeah, you know, it can be quite challenging. <laughs> yeah. But I think that the pull of art making is much stronger than all those challenges. Mm. Uh, yeah, so the healing power of art making is really one of the main reasons I paint. Um, and I, my hope is always that some of that healing power ends up in my paintings so that when people uh, look at them or acquire them uh, that energy is there for them wonderful mm -hmm. so, so because uh, sorry go ahead no I was just uh, thinking as you explained like uh, it is an emotional release for you mm -hmm. yes it can be yeah. and uh, it is you understanding yourself yeah and you know the deeper you go in anything in life uh, the more universal your understandings become 
and this is why it can then appeal to other people too, not just yourself. Yes. Yeah. So if you stay on the surface, it doesn't appeal to a wider audience. If you go deeper, you can reach more people. So I, I was also offering workshops in using art for healing. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, um, I had to learn to do all that online. And I found that really difficult, not having that personal connection. Um, yeah. Um, so I started training as a coach mm -hmm. and, um, you know, as a basic life coach, I thought I have to do something else online now. And um, of course, you know, your own interests always take over. Yeah. So, you know, um, when I coach, I do use art making, create the power of creativity to help people. Um, but my main uh, focus in coaching is to help people be present in their body. Because so many of us are lost in our mind yes. and thoughts. Yes. Uh, so this is what somatic coaching is. Uh, the word somatic comes from the Greek soma, which means body. Yeah. Another word for somatic is embodiment. That's what I found in your profile. Yes. So this is what I like doing. I like, I like helping people come home to their body. So beautiful. So our bodies are home. That's what I understand from you. Yes. Yes. Because <laughs> mo mo most of us live in our heads, yes. right? And then we're, we're kind of not in touch with what's going on from the neck down. You know? <laughs> it's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting. Oh, my God. I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unless, of course, we do body stuff like yoga, walking, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a practice that's become very popular called earthing. I don't know if you've heard of it. Not. Is it grounding? It's, it's a form of grounding. It's basically um, walking on the earth um, barefoot. barefoot. Okay. Yeah. Which our you know, ancestors have been yes. doing for a long they time. Did it. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now that's come back. It's a way of healing. It really heals uh, inflammation and all kinds of things in the body. And there is a, a movie on it on YouTube called uh, The Earthing Movie. Wow. I'm going to watch it. <laughs> yeah. So wonderful. So wonderful. Coming back to your to home is coming back to your body. Or coming back to your body is coming back to your home. Yes, that's well said. Yeah. <laughs> that is so wonderful. I mean, uh, we just keep uh, looking outside and uh, everywhere else, but not uh, in ourselves. It's easier, right? Yes. It's easier to look outside. So we have yeah. been uh, living in an escape mode? I think we're kind of conditioned. Conditioned. Uh, to look outside of ourselves, you know. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And uh, this is uh, such a. I think this is a not a very uh, peaceful um, conditioning. To to always like like the conditioning to to look uh, look for everything outside. Yeah, the, I think the only way you don't really do that is if you're born to enlightened parents. Enlightened like, parents. Uh, some, uh, yeah, like some of the saints in India had parents uh, that were quite evolved. Mm. Um, one of the teachers I used to follow in the south of India, her name is Karuna Mai. She, uh, she was pretty well born enlightened. You know, there's many teachers like mm. that. So then they don't have to worry about conditioning like the rest of us. <laughs> what I feel is, is uh, when you were explaining about enlightened uh, parents or uh, uh, enlightened by birth, uh, is like they, they are their true self. That's what I understand. When you say somebody mm -hmm. is enlightened, 
that means they are true mm-hmm. to themselves yes they're they're being their authentic self yeah, yeah? and i think our journey is always to find and be our authentic self yeah. and that we can only find inside of us right yes and uh, that has become a struggle yeah it doesn't need to be a struggle but um it can definitely be a struggle at times yeah but nowadays yeah. Uh, people are struggling mm-hmm. struggling within themselves because they are not themselves yes mhm that's that is true individual yeah. struggle in a personal level mhm and uh, living a parallel life and uh, which is affecting uh, psychologically and uh, we have bipolar <laughs> oh yes yeah <laughs> Yeah everyone's path is so individual. Yes. You know? And um uh, I think nowadays there are so many things out there that people can look to for help. Yes. Um so many spiritual uh, tools and paths and people and all kinds of things which is a good thing but it's also it can also overwhelm people. Yes. You know. Yeah. It can. people can try this or that and then get confused you know yes too many things yeah. <laughs> too many things to choose from <laughs> that's right yes <laughs> that's wonderful so i would also like to ask you like uh, um, you are a visual artist right what what uh, how do you explain that So a visual artist is uh, someone who creates uh, things like paintings you know um that's just uh words that people have coined mm-hmm. because if you just say you're an artist you could be a musician oh. uh, you could be a sculptor you know uh so uh, or some other kind of okay. art so a visual artist is usually a painter oh good to know i didn't know about that and so mm-hmm. it is like a specific term for yes okay. yeah in the art world uh that's what's used yeah. okay okay and i have to say that the picture of the rose i just couldn't help but share it <laughs> oh yeah thank you yeah that's that's a picture i took um, not far from where i live in a in a park uh in the summer uh in some of the parks here because a lot of people live in apartment buildings and they don't have uh, a garden to grow things okay. in, in some of the parks they have these parcels that people can get okay. where they grow where they grow their uh, vegetables oh, and flowers community and garden yeah that's right that's the word yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so um this was i saw this there mm-hmm. and i thought oh my god this is so beautiful this is summer you know summer roses yeah they were so beautiful adorable <laughs> <laughs> uh, I felt like uh, it, they were so lively the picture was so lively that I felt like oh my god it would have been better if I, I could uh, smell it right now right away <laughs> Ah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah flowers uh, you know nature <clears throat> nature is so inspiring right especially for um people who paint and other artists uh, and nature is so healing yes. right when we have a lot of troubles our mind is very busy all we have to do is go into nature and take a walk alone and things become a lot calmer or go for a long walk yes. you know along the ocean or something and get many times we receive our answers yeah. right and i think nature is such a blessing it you know it is it is definitely sometimes uh, mm-hmm. you feel like you are more close to yourself when you are walking or when you are smelling a flower or or you are just listening to birds just listening to the trees when they are moving i don't know i like them yes. i like them so i'm just uh, explaining to you <laughs> yeah th- those are all basically uh, god's creations yes. right and so i think if we connect with them we feel much better and we feel ourselves yes. yeah. yeah so yeah nature is very inspiring it is and i like to go to nature when it's not raining yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> and even when it's raining, sometimes it's really nice to go when it's yeah. raining because there's nobody yes. there. You know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's just you and the ducks. Uh-huh. You know? <laughs> yes, yes. Are you talking about Burnaby uh, Deer Lake Park? Uh, no, I live near Ambleside in, in West Bend. Okay, okay. So which yeah. one is Deep Cove is uh, closer to you? Deep Cove? No, Deep, Deep Cove is in North Vancouver, oh. um, at the other end of uh, North Vancouver. So this is, uh, you remember Horseshoe Bay? Horseshoe Bay, yes. Yeah, so this is closer to um, that part of town. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah there's uh, Ambleside Beach, Dunderave Beach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so I, I always, uh, I always try to live close to nature. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. So that um, I don't feel that removed from it. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Because a lot of times when I'm working, I can't always go for a walk or anything. But then it, I can look outside and see nature, oh, yeah. and it, it feels better. Is- but if you don't have that, you can always put a lot of plants in your place. Oh, yes. You know? Fill your balcony with all kinds of things. I mean, I see, yes. I mean, if you love yeah. nature, I don't think you can stay away from uh, plants, uh, planting trees at home, planting <laughs> plants at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This was one of the hard parts for me when I lived in Paris. Uh, although there are lots of parks there, it's not these wild kind of parks that we have here. You know? uh, the parks there are very manicured. Oh, wow. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't feel the same. Oh, it way. doesn't feel natural. It's still natural, but it doesn't feel. Um, I think the human hand is too much in it. You know, yeah. Let's have these in a particular row and this. The arrangement and that, is. You know? uh, yeah. Uh, very. What do you say? Humanly. Yeah, I mean, you know, people come from all over the world there to see these yeah. parks. You know. So they plan it for tourists. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, no, no. It didn't start off like that, of course. You know, <laughs> like um, you know, Versailles, the Palace of Versailles. Mm-hmm. Those parks are very well known and are very nice to look at. Uh, but I personally, I like living close to more wilderness. Yes, I understood. Right? I got you. Yeah, yeah like, uh, like it is the way they are. I mean. They are their true self when you go to the park. Suppose you are going on a hike or on a trail, like nobody has maintained or created. You know, they, they have just grown up there. Mm-hmm. So they are their true self. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, they're maintained to a certain yeah, degree, but, but not to that degree where everything is, yeah. you know, cut, 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 and what have you. Yeah. yeah. And na- nature is what really saved me. When I moved here, <laughs> when I was so young, um, I was quite miserable at first because um, I didn't speak English, oh. right? And um, all the Indian people in our community, they came f- mostly from ex-British colonies in Africa. And so I couldn't relate to them okay. because the, the French mindset is so <clears throat> different. And um, um, it was all very different. You know? And I didn't have much independence because when I was living in Africa, in Brussels, um, I could go anywhere by myself. Like in Brussels, I could just take transit, take the subway. Whereas here, my parents bought this house on a hill, you know, with a beautiful view. But every time I wanted to go somewhere, I had to ask one of them for a ride, you know, because um, the transit was very poor at that time. Uh, so I would go to nature you know, after school and just sit there. And um, I would think, well, at least... This part is really nice here. <laughs> How wonderful. And then, of course, of course, things got better once I started speaking the language. But for a long time, I didn't want to learn English. Because I, I grew up in a culture, like the, the, at that time, it's changed now, because now everyone speaks English, right? That's the language to learn. But at that time, when I was young, uh, the French people didn't, you know, they always put down the British they didn't like learning English. So in my schooling, I di- there was no option to take English as a class. You know? There were other options like German and Spanish and Dutch and all that. 
so I had a lot of resistance. Like, why should I learn this mm-hmm. language? You know? <laughs> but this this uh, uh, thing that you're explaining uh, was it back in uh, Africa? Yeah, I mean, it it existed in all French speaking countries French-speaking at that time, countries. especially okay. especially it's it's the it was the French mindset. mindset. Yes. I mean, um, for the French, you know, France is the center of the mm-hmm. universe. So, you know, that's what you should focus on. Yeah. And um, so now English is the lingua franca, right? Everywhere. Yeah. And then um, you didn't really need to learn English to survive in the world. But now you do need it everywhere to do business or anything. I think uh, it is after like people started moving from country to country and uh, because of globalization and so many other things. Yes, that's what uh, yeah. I think affected uh, other people to learn different languages. Yeah, and colonization, yeah. you know. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but then you know, it was funny because my parents said, oh, "We're only here for three years, and then we're going back." They kind of just said that to me so that I would settle oh, down. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And so I learned, I learned the mm-hmm. language and, you know, um, I didn't learn it the conventional mm-hmm. way. I, I watched a lot of TV to learn it. I read the dictionary and I read newspapers. Because um, in the Belgian school system, one of our homework was to read one page of the dictionary every one night. One page of dictionary? Yeah. They would say, don't read the Bible, read the dictionary. Ah. <laughs> So I, I liked reading dictionaries, and um, the French make very beautiful dictionaries. They are they look like art books. Oh, really? You know? Yeah, like like fine art. The books. one thing that I have hated in my life is dictionaries. <laughs> oh. Well, maybe it's because they're not attractive. No, they don't have any picture. World. They don't have any picture, yeah. and it's like um, everything is so tense. You know, A busy book. Yeah, it's it's very it's a condensed, book. right? It's a busy yeah. book. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I bought a dictionary here, and it was uh, it looked like a phone mm-hmm. book. Yeah. Um, the paper was really thin, you know, like, and there were no pictures, oh, and it was really boring to go through it. And of course, now nobody uses those dictionaries. They all look at things online. Yes. Um, but the French dictionaries were beautiful. Like, mm-hmm. You know, there would be like large dictionaries. Wow. And you would enjoy looking at it like an Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you have pictures, then why not? Pictures and some words. Pictures and some (laughs) words. Because there were pictures, like when I say reading one page of the dictionary, it didn't mean reading text, right? Yeah. It was interspersed with pictures. Yeah. That's interesting to know. I never knew that a dictionary had pictures. This is the first time I'm uh, getting to know that dictionaries yeah. had pictures. Wow, that's great. I, I, I never liked dictionaries, but now I feel like, okay, now I think they should make some dictionaries with pictures. <laughs> yeah, especially for young kids, right? I think they have yeah, them, I right? I think for, for young kids, they have pictures. And, yeah. 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 No, so this this was for big kids. <laughs> <laughs> big kids, they don't want. Uh, they don't. They shouldn't be looking at pictures, or they should be focused only on words. <laughs> no, they they should be focused on both. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so focused on both. Uh, what I mean is like you 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 read a word, and then you, you have your own picture. Yeah, that's good too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good too. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> Can you still see me well? Because on my side, I, it's a very a lot of dark stuff. Even though all the lights are on here, I can see you well. Yes. Okay. Oh, that's Do you good. want to switch yeah. on any lights? You can. Oh, they are. They're all on. Yeah, I, I think I. Can. It's. I mean, it's it's day. You know, it's daytime yeah. here. Yeah. It's about twelve. Um, Noon. But the the weather has really changed. Like every day we had sunshine, but um, since yesterday it started raining. So now it's kind of grayish. Okay. Yeah. The natural Vancouver weather. Mm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. We we it always takes us some time to get used to the rain yeah. again. Yeah. We've had several weeks of sunshine. 
which is unusual. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we needed the rain because now um, there are droughts in some parts yes. of Vancouver. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what else should we talk about? Yeah, I was just thinking of some questions like... Uh, yeah uh, some stories from you that you 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 shared with me any of the stories you want to share about your uh, spirituality how it started how it occurred to you and uh, what kept you uh, going deep into spirituality oh my god that could be a long long conversation <laughs> i'm ready for it um. <laughs> <laughs> um where shall i start well spirituality is is i it's not something i consciously chose you know as an adult mm -hmm. i i was born in an ismaili family okay. and i i think in india ismailis are called aga khani aga khani um, yeah. it's it's a branch of shia islam okay. quite a, a liberal okay. branch uh, so i was born in a family in, in an Ismaili family and um, our practice was uh, you know to pray at um, sunrise and sunset <laughs> and uh, so we we have prayers in the evening and the morning practice starts at four in the morning a meditation practice mm -hmm. so most Ismailis don't do the 4 a.m. Okay. one because it's quite optional mm -hmm. nobody's forcing you to do anything yeah. Um, but somehow, when I was a kid, I was very drawn to 4 a.m. Yeah. Uh, we lived right next to our prayer mm -hmm. hall. So I used to go by myself. And um, my mother used to freak out when she wouldn't see me in bed anymore. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to because you can see me better yes. now. Yeah, because it's too dark on that side. Um, where was I? So, Mother um, would be terrified. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah so I, I, you know, I went quite often as a kid, like very young kid. Um, and then, you know, school started and all that, so I didn't go much. But there was, there was a lot of... Um, spiritual information um, that I would share with my mother mm -hmm. and she would always freak out. She said, don't say this to anybody. People, <laughs> people will think you're crazy. <laughs> but I was like, but mom, you know, da, 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 da. <laughs> she said, no, you don't, you don't talk about these things. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So that was that. And um, what all did you ask? Can, can you share one question? What did I ask? To your God? mom. <laughs> um, I would share what I would oh, hear inside of me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would share about the spirits that I would see in the trees, and because we had a we had a home with uh, a central courtyard, okay. you know, with a with a big jambu tree. Okay. Are you familiar with jambu trees? Jambu, is it a fruit? Yeah, it's a fruit. Yeah. No. I, I don't know if the, I don't know whether that's an Indian word or a African word, but anyways, uh, so I used to spend a lot of time in that tree. I would climb the tree and just hang out there for many hours, wow. and that's where I would hear all kinds of things. And I'd be very happy to hear those things, but then nobody wanted to hear about it, so I didn't talk much about that. Um, and then you know, just continued with whatever I was brought up with. Um, and then when we had to move, you know, at that time, um, in neighboring Uganda, all the um, Asians were expelled by the government. Mm -hmm. So they ended up, you know, a lot of them ended up in Canada and in the UK and the US and in Europe. And the year after, um, our family had to leave mm -hmm. too. Um, I was part of a very large extended family 
And our family was the first Indian family to settle in Rwanda. Wow. And they had accumulated a lot of wealth as a result. And so um, we were told to leave too. We, had, we were given just one week to leave. And uh, that's when um, the whole spiritual thing came back again, wondering why we had to mm. leave and, um, you know, what is the divine plan for mm. this. And uh, I never, ever thought in my wildest dream that I would end up here in Vancouver. Mm. It was just a place in a map that I had studied in school, right? <laughs> yeah. um, I knew I would end up in Europe for studies and mm -hmm. stuff, um, but not all the way here. So, um, as I said, I didn't, um, when we came here, I, I, I found I wasn't really fitting in my community mm -hmm. here. Because <clears throat> I couldn't speak English and their mindset was mm -hmm. very different. And I was brought up very free, yeah. you know, to go anywhere I wanted. And um, the people from East Africa, um, especially the girls, the women, the women, did not have that kind of freedom. They couldn't go anywhere without being accompanied by their brothers mm -hmm. or their fathers, somebody adult. So it was very uh, constricting for me. Um, and then eventually, I don't recall exactly how, but I, um, oh yes, um, I had met uh, this young boy when I was 17. And um, he talked a lot about, he was a tennis player, and he talked a lot, a lot about his coach and how they were using uh, Buddhist philosophies. And at that time, it wasn't so mainstream in the West. And so I got very curious. I thought, oh, tell me more, tell me more. And, um, eventually, I ended up, um, I think now, now they call it mindfulness at that time. Even now, I think it was called Vipassana, a Vipassana retreat. Mm -hmm. Vipassana. Um, so this, is a, this is a form of uh, what they call Theravadan Buddhism. Mm -hmm. and the teachers were from Burma. Um, this couple that I still follow, uh, a white American man with a Filipina wife, and they had, they had studied with Burmese teachers. So um, I went to that retreat and I remember feeling like such a sense of homecoming. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is home. Wow. So I, I did that kind of practice and um, I was lucky that my family didn't mind. You know, they just let me do whatever I wanted. And I, I continued with Ismaili practice. I didn't see any conflict mm -hmm. between the two. But I really liked uh, this mindfulness practice. You know, um, and it came to a point where I wanted to do more and more of it. And by that time, I was uh, not living with my parents. And um, but I, I really wanted to know who I really was, and who God was, and why I'm here, and why life is so difficult at times. So um, now I have the sun on me. <laughs> um, so I went to a small island off the Sunshine Coast. Sunshine Coast, yeah. Um, yeah. One of my big influences was uh, Joseph Campbell. I don't know if you've ever read his books. Um, he's well known for a book called The Power of Myth. No, not really. No. Um, so, he, so he would write a lot about how during World War II, he had isolated himself in a cabin and he was reading all these books and writing and so I thought that's what I want to do <laughs> that's how I'll find out who I am you know so I went uh, to a cabin and it was a bit drastic for me I didn't last very long because it was a cabin uh, without um, running water or electricity or anything like that and I was pretty freaked out at night because it was totally isolated on an island um, and that's when I started praying like mad. <laughs> interesting, very interesting. Um, so I only lasted about a week. And then I came back home, but it totally changed me. Some Whatever happened there. Um, and then I was exploring other things. Um, 
there was a famous Indian teacher called Yogananda. Mm -hmm. You know him? No, I, I, I don't. Oh. I mean, I haven't really explored much, but I have heard. Yeah, he's long passed away, but he was one of the first uh, Indian gurus who brought <clears throat> uh, yoga yeah. and all that to, yeah. uh, to the mm -hmm. West. Yeah. Uh, so I was into a lot of his works and um, the thing that stayed with me, it was uh, the mindfulness. And, um, Eventually, as I told you last time we spoke, I met uh, Eckhart mm. Tolle, who's well known for The Power yeah. of Now. Uh, but one thing, um, I'm sorry, I'm a bit frustrated with the light change. <laughs> but you can come closer if you want to. You can come closer if you want to. Yeah, you can Oh, but it becomes, it, it becomes dark? You want, you want to move or put your... I mean, do, you can still I see can. it because... Yes, the screen that I see makes me look totally dark. So I, that's why I was I can moving. see you. I can see you. Yeah. See, this is a practice in staying centered and not worked up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I am really um, curious to know what you are sharing. So my focus is totally on what you are saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so what, one of the things I found... Um, especially by uh, listening to some Indian gurus in the Advaita tradition. Ayurveda. No, Advaita. Advaita, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ramana Maharshi yeah, yeah, and yeah. all these very well, very well known yeah. people. Uh, they all kept on saying, you know, we're not the body. No, we are not the body. Yeah. And I had a big reaction to that. I was like, what do you mean? I never said anything, but um, I thought, what do you mean we're not the body? Of course we're the body. We're not only yes. the body, right? But I had a real allergic reaction to hearing we're not the no, body. No, I can hear you. I, I feel the same way. Like, how can you not uh -huh. consider body? Where is the mm -hmm. mind coming from if you don't have the body? Well, how were you how born, you right, born? without a body? And how how <laughs> yeah. the spirit is dwelling on? Where is the spirit's dwelling place if you don't consider yourself a body? Mm -hmm. And where, how is so all think, the suffering coming from if we don't have the body? Well, they claim that that's where the suffering comes from because we're identified with the body. Mm -hmm. I think that's what they are trying to say is we are not only the body because so many people are overly identified yes. With the, with the material world, with the body. And so I th this is just my understanding. No, no, no. I could be that's totally fine. wrong. That's, totally, um, uh, that's a fact. Yeah. So maybe it's to encourage people to turn inwards. Um, they would say such things, but that kind of stayed with me. And I was really called to, um, what are the words to... To put the body in, in its rightful sacred place and so you know my coaching practice is is called spirit and form um, and this is the reason why because spirit and form are they one, are one. They, they are one and even though people are always separating them you know you are the body and then you are the mind and then you are the spirit and i think they were separated for purposes of explanation mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, but actually they are one yeah. and I think this is uh, this is what I called I am called to uh, put out there you know um, that spirit and form are one they are part of the same continuum and yes eventually we don't see the body anymore um, but while we are alive here on this earth, the body is definitely a very important aspect of ourselves, you know. Because uh, even the gurus, without the body, they would not be able to teach. Yes. Um, so it's, it's a topic um, that's very close to my heart. And this is one of the reasons when I uh, studied coaching I was once again attracted to somatic coaching because it had to do with bringing people back to the body the people like Eckhart Tolle say 
because every cell of your body is sacred <clears throat> and i think we've gotten away from that sacredness and that might account for a lot of things yes know? yeah yes that sacredness so, is not making sense now <laughs> yeah the body is sacred um but it's a very in some spiritual circles it's a very common understanding that we're not the yes. body and uh, yeah. i don't know i feel like if you talk about uh, we are not the body then uh, it is a uh, you are dissociating from uh, you are divided from inside there's a division yes. there's a separation inside yeah i remember when i was uh, listening to one particular teacher in the advaita tradition i mean basically this if we are not the body then what are you you are spirit you know um but then i had a really hard time functioning in the world you know um and my mother would always tell me there is din but there is also dunya you know the inner and outer um you use the same words in yes. hindi right in din and dunya yes yeah, yeah. so um i had a really hard time with dunya um and one of the central teachings in the religion that i was brought up in ismailism is to keep a balance between din and dunya not forsake one I or the other i think that is the teaching of every uh, religion mm -hmm. i think and i think uh, yogananda said the same yeah. thing um i remember reading somewhere yeah. that when he died um his body stayed intact for a very long time at least a month if not longer i can recall and i i think it's because he he did not um uh discard the body um, it's it's a topic that still has a lot of questions for me um but definitely i feel uh, that it is important um to be in both din and dunya yes. and i believe the final enlightenment comes in the body in the world yes very very well explained and said <laughs> i've i've spent time in um retreat centers in ashrams and um one of the funny things i'll share with you is when i was living in new mexico mm -hmm. uh one of the famous uh, indian mothers divine mothers she has an ashram there okay. um i feel bad if i forget what she's called ma something <laughs> um so i was staying there for a while and um at the same time i was very attracted to what uh, other things new mexico offer i mean new mexico that whole santa fe area is a hotbed for spiritual stuff right uh but i i was very much into flamenco at that time in uh, and into flamenco flamenco yeah. and so at that time um in the neighboring city albuquerque there was a big flamenco festival every year they have that and i really wanted to go watch some of these people because for me that kind of dancing is sacred too mm -hmm. it is spiritual <coughs> so in the middle of the night or early evening rather i would um, take my car and drive to albuquerque wow and watch watch these shows and come back in the middle of the night you know um and then i'd have to wake up a dawn for the practices in the mm -hmm. ashram but i i didn't dare tell anybody what i was doing in the evenings <laughs> <laughs> oh my god because <laughs> uh, i thought it would be really disrespectful um so you know again this, this i saw that the, the two were separated you know and i i think those retreat centers are important if sometimes you need to get away from the world and go deep inside and um do that journey as well yes um but now i'm definitely a believer in being grounded in both and it's not always easy mm -hmm. 
Because my tendency is always to much more comfort in the din world than the dunya world. Yeah. Um, but I was born in the right family because my whole family is very much in the dunya world. <laughs> so dunya, in, in you dunya, you mean to say dunya is materialistic, right? Material world. And din yeah. is uh, spiritual. Uh, yeah, the inner, the inner world. world yes. Yeah, yeah. I, they're not necessarily materialistic, but they don't mind engaging in the world. And, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Running, running businesses and yeah. working and yeah. partying and you know all yeah. that stuff. Um. So right now, I'm really exploring the question of money. You know how that fits into din and dunya. That's really interesting. Did I, you share your experience that you were sharing uh, about money? About money and how? Uh, yes, your experience with money definitely. Why not? It's a good topic too. It's it's very much relatable to everybody. Well, my personal uh, my personal journey with money um, has been quite challenging uh, because of the things I choose to do, like artwork. Um, <laughs> There was a lot of judgment from my family. You know, why don't you do something concrete? You know, they didn't consider it as real. Uh, and I, I told them a lot of artists make good money, yeah. you know. But that was not, they didn't, you know, people don't have too many examples of that. And like most Indians, you know, there are only three choices, uh, law, <laughs> business, or something in a medical field. Right? That's right, it's <laughs> conventional. Yeah, well, you know, I think it's because of it's secure, it's secure. Yeah, um, sorry, right. I grew up, I grew up with a family that made a lot of money. Um, but from a very young age, I saw that money did not buy happiness, awesome. it bought a lot of things, but not necessarily <laughs> happiness. And so, I kind of, uh, I think, I inside of me, I kind of rejected money which made it really hard for me to make money. What? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I did not get you. What did you say? Uh, how, how far did you hear? I just missed the last part. Okay. I rejected, rejected. money because I saw that I saw money didn't buy happiness. happiness okay. wow. Necessarily. Yes. It bought a lot of temporary yes. happiness, but not, not that deep yes. happiness. And so I had to really reconcile that within me because I needed to make a living. Mm, yes. Um, and still do and so after a lot of journeying you know um, what I have learned is um, especially if you're self-employed in a field that's notorious mm -hmm. for people thinking you're not going to make money like artwork <laughs> I like that word <laughs> it's a playful word <laughs> notorious <laughs> Yeah, so I, I've just learned to go inside, mm -hmm. you know, in the din world and just ask for guidance about mm -hmm. what to do. And then um, I have to then implement the guidance. And that's sometimes quite difficult to take action on the guidance because sometimes the guidance is <laughs> way out there. Like, it's like, what? You know, was that real? You know, was that my imagination or was that? You know, was that really uh, God telling me what to do? Or, you know, was that really intuition? Because sometimes what you're told to do okay, is, is quite challenging. Is. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> and so it's a, it's a continuing journey. I'm always learning. I don't think the journey is ever over in that way. And, uh, but I found, at least I found uh, this methodology of first asking inside before taking action. But sometimes when we panic, we start taking action. Oh, let me quickly take this job or that job. And then you're miserable. Um, so at least now I have the discipline to go inside first, <laughs> no matter what's happening around me. Wow. Um, and I think more and more, so many people are now teaching that you know, to get in touch with your intuition. Uh, one of my big influences, which I think you might have heard of her, Julia Cameron. She wrote a book called The Artist's Way. No. No? Oh, that's a wonderful uh, book. The Arti Artist's Way? The, yeah. What is the name of the author? Julia Cameron. C-A-M-E-R-O-N. I need to explore 
art world now. <laughs> Yeah, I used to offer um, workshops uh, using her oh. work, the artist's oh, wow. way. It's, it's a it's a twelve week journey. Okay. Yeah, <coughs> and it's it's very much about what I'm talking about, Dean and okay. Dunya. Yeah, and I I think the advantage if you read her book is there are so many examples of people who've taken that journey. It takes a lot of courage to take that journey. It would be much easier for me right now to go work as an accountant and have a nice income, you know. But then, you know, life is short and I can't uh, spend my time like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, that's the long, long answer to your question about my spiritual life. Yeah. I think you still missed your first uh, uh, mindfulness teacher, the story about you. Uh, Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. I first discovered mindfulness through uh, yeah. his books <laughs> and, and his uh, audio books. And there was, there was something about him that was so calming, you know, and still is when I listen to him. And so I really like that whole world, uh, the mindful world. Um, I sometimes have a really hard time with my own community, the Ismaili community. For example, yesterday there was a big celebration in the evening. So, you know, first there are prayers, and after the prayers, it was dinner and celebration, you know, dandia and all that. But for me, it was just so noisy, you know, it was like, oh, when can I go home? <laughs> um, so you, I have to be in the mood for that. So I, I find it hard sometimes to make the transition from prayers. Yes, to it's just contrast. Most people, it's a contrast. But most Ismailis don't have a problem with that. Um, so yesterday I went in our social hall and I had a dinner. I had to ask them for vegetarian food because usually the dinners are not. And... Um, had my veggie food and I didn't feel like staying because I thought I just want to go home because <laughs> <you know? laughs> um, it's just too noisy. Uh, I mean, it's very beautiful to look at the garbas and the dandia and a lot of the films and you know, it was, it was going to be a long yeah. night. Yeah, I, I took an Uber home. <laughs> yeah. But I still, I, I, um, I think I, at some point I had to decide um, what religion I was going to die in, you know, oh. because those rituals are important, because I'm, the body is body. important to me. Yes. Right? So how my body would be disposed at the end, I had to think about oh, that. Wow. Yeah, do I want to be cremated <laughs> or do I want to be buried? So I decided I do want to die as an Ismaili. Um, so that's how it's going to be. Because I, I don't really have a problem with uh, uh, the actual religion. It's just uh, uh, the material part is a bit too um, emphasized. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. And the dressing up and everything. Um, I think you are used to that in your own culture. Like, for example, with Navratri, people really dress up. And yes, everything. they do. But in... But in the Buddhist world, it was very simple. People dress very yes. simply. So I got used to that. Yeah. You know, I didn't need I didn't need that many clothes anymore. <laughs> I didn't need um, to buy all this really nice Indian clothing and all that. Um, so that's been my journey. Um, I think when when my mother was alive, it was a bit hard for her because all her friends' daughters were different you know they're very much like that and um, my mother was uh, a very beautiful woman and very very well known for being refined in her dressing i have everything. seen her so when i have was, met her you i have met her oh in a concert yeah wherever we met I, she used to be always with you oh so you you knew what yeah. she looked like yeah yeah um at that time she had already become a bit mm. ill but um she was always very refined you know like not one hair out of yeah place. i have seen her like uh, her face perfectly done her hair's perfectly done yeah yeah 
then people would not believe that I was her daughter, you know, because I, I was I had such a different, different way. Different choices. Being. Yeah, and everyone then believed, because uh, my mom looked quite young too. Everyone believed that my father had a first wife and I was the offspring. <laughs> So I would tell my mom, you better tell everyone I'm your real yeah. daughter. <laughs> you, you should have, you. I mean, you are the enlightened one, I would say. Uh, no, by no, means, <laughs> by no means am I enlightened. <laughs> no, I feel it. <laughs> uh, no, I'm interested in that, but I, by no means am I there. No, 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 no. How, how can uh, you say that you are not there? Do you, I don't know, when you talk about enlightenment, it's like a big thing for, you know, like, it's like very big, but I don't know whenever I have read books about that, it's like very little things that, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you can be in it. Yeah, you can have, you can have yes. moments, right? You can have moments. I've had yeah. moments, uh, but my idea, which I'm slowly giving up, is one of that you, all, you are in that one continuous moment. But I think that, that will only happen, you know, when I'm underground. <laughs> yeah. I'm no, that's no longer my uh, mm. goal. For a long time, I was very idealistic and uh, wanted to be in that continuous uh, state of light all the time. And uh, I found that uh, once I had to deal with dunya, that was not possible really for yes. me. Because um, I, you know, all my ego came up. You know, when I had to deal with people I worked with and everything, um, it wasn't it wasn't okay to necessarily be all holy moly with them yes you know? yes yeah and then i learned that's spiritual too to be really real with yeah. people you know that's also spiritual. That is spiritual yes yeah and that took me a long time to kind of click in you know because i had a lot of judgment every time i got angry or whatever i had so much judgment on myself mm -hmm. one day when my one of my younger brothers told me he said, oh, well, you know, even those enlightened gurus have angry moments. And then I started watching them and I thought, he's, he's right, they do. <laughs> I, I, I also feel like that. Like, <clears throat> how is it possible to be in uh, one state of mind all the time, all your life? How is it possible? I don't know. I, I think... Um, I think one way it would be possible is if you're removed yes, from the world. Yes, that's what I'm, ta I'm saying. Like, yeah. If you are no more dealing with materialistic world and uh, mm -hmm. you are very much in your isolate, isolated world and you are dealing with the people who really understand you and you are in that circle, you know, then, then you are dealing with the same state of mind people, like people, like-minded people, right? And you are not affected, mm -hmm. so you are just the same all the time. Probably, I don't know. It's still, um, I don't have a definitive answer for that. I think there are people who live in a constant state of bliss, you know. Um, so I, I really don't know. I now just focus on what's happening with me. And then I, I share whatever I can. Yeah. And my whole goal in my uh, coaching is to help people find their own answers. Yes. I don't tell anybody what to believe, what to think. It's just to get them connected to themselves so they hear their own answers. Because that's the only thing that will stay with people and will help them. Yes. And then ideally for them to learn to do that for themselves. Yes. I, you, the way you were saying it is like the way you have got your answers. That the way you have yes. followed your answers. The way you have manifest, manifested your answers, like you said, when you were really young, you visit, you used to go to your neighbor's house, right? Japanese family, and then yes. you saw their uh, artwork, and then that stayed with you. And then after 17 years of your life, or 10 years of your life, you again went back to that state, you know, like, something is missing, something is missing, like, and then again, when you saw this uh, uh, Japanese in, in in university, you said right. You you met someone yeah. after yeah after university. Yeah. Yeah. So so it 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 was there constantly within you. Well, one of the reasons I was attracted to that um, 
I found out later when I was actually studying that kind of calligraphy was that um, when the Zen monks and the masters and their students did that kind of calligraphy, they did it from a, a, a state of center and presence, you know. And so I think when I was looking at those works, that's what I sensed. Um, because um, years later, um, before I actually studied formally with this Japanese master, I had gone to the Seattle Asian Art Museum and um, they have a section of scrolls, ancient Chinese calligraphy. And I remember looking at them and I was just struck. I couldn't move. And it, it was that kind of, uh, in the art world, they call it aesthetic arrest. But what it actually was, is, was that you could sense um, the spiritual presence of the artist. Wow. It, gets, it gets transmitted into their work. And so I remember sitting there for what felt like hours. And then I was even more eager to learn that kind of artwork. But it was, it was really, really hard to learn with that first person. Um, I often say this, yeah, because she was so strict. And, um, you know, um, it's something that was done in total silence. Like in Western art classes, there's a lot of chit chat and people are moving around and, you know. But this kind of work is done in silence. Like talking is not really allowed, you know, other than the teacher talking. And sometimes the silence was so thick, you could just cut it with a knife. And that part was really hard for me. I just wanted to run from there. You know? um, but I'm glad I stayed because then you, you get breakthroughs, you know. You hear a lot of insights. Um, and you, you, you spent hours thinking, pushing the same character over and over and over again. And just when you would feel like, I don't think I can do any more of this, something would, you know, open in you. Yeah. But it, it, it was very hard because um, there was a lot of funny moments, you know. I would, even before I used to take snacks with me, you know, in case I got hungry during the class. And um, like an apple or something. But that was a real no-no. Like, you did not eat. Oh in that environment because i i didn't know this i guess it's like a a temple, for oh, them, right? okay. a temple. so you know i get hungry so i take my apple start eating and she would look at me apple <laughs> <laughs> and her presence was so strong that my hand would start <laughs> um and she would just say no eating and then we would get a lunch break, but she wouldn't eat anything. The teacher wouldn't eat anything. Like we would eat something. Um, so that part, you know, when you had like many consecutive days like that, it was uh, quite trying. Now the other Japanese teacher I studied with in Ottawa, she wasn't so strict. Thank God. Um, but it was still, you know, the same discipline. And she looked at first, you know, they never accept you as a student just like that. With her, it took like three years before she accepted me as a student. Uh, first, I called her and um, told her I wanted to study with her. Uh, so she says, call me later, hang up, you know? And I was like, what? Because <laughs> that's not how we are used to dealing with Westerners. Um, <coughs> So she didn't, send me. she didn't reply to anything. And I went on her website and I ordered her books and everything. And I just never heard back from her. I left messages. Then one time, three years later, she came to Vancouver. And she called me and she said, uh, I'm just going back home from Japan and we are stopping here for a couple of days. So um, you can come and see me. And show me, she said, come and show me all the work you've done using my method, you know, which is this 3B method. And I hadn't done anything because I thought, well, she's not responding, so I'm not doing anything, you know. So I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do now? I, I really wanted to meet her. So 
I took some of my old work that I had done with that first teacher. Uh, and if these people are really incisive. They, they can tell, you know. So I went to her hotel room and I took my, because uh, I wanted a lesson from her. So I took my rice paper and ink and everything. And um, first she asked me to show her the old work. And she spent a long time. I, I was just sweating away because she was taking uh, such a long time. And then she said, um, I see you have been, you had a very good teacher. You have been very well trained. And that's when I started appreciating that discipline. Until then, I was quite resentful about that kind of discipline. And then she taught me her way. And uh, after that, she expected me to practice it every day. And she was calling me. She was very committed after that. She was calling me all the time. Like, and I wouldn't do it every day. I didn't have that kind of discipline. Um, she was, okay, so what have you done? Show me, you know. And these were the days before we could do these video calls, right? Mm. So I had to make everything to her and she would make it back. And um, it was quite luxurious that way. It, it was really nice to meet a Japanese teacher who was not so strict. <laughs> You know, because and this was actually an older woman. The first teacher was a okay. younger woman. This woman was quite old, and she actually died soon after I oh. met her. Um, yeah. Um, but she 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 told me that she wanted me to teach this stuff. And in their tradition, once you know a master, a guru tells you to teach that stuff, it becomes your mm. obligation. So I, I will be teaching that stuff again. Wow. Um, I, I find it challenging to teach that. I, I feel like I can never teach it the way I thought. Yeah. But with, you know, with her blessing and with her um, teaching, I was able to show that kind of that East Asian work in, um, in Japan and in the Japanese embassy in Ottawa which I could ne never have been able to do without her. I'm very grateful, uh, very grateful that I was able to study with her. Yeah. So I'll stop here, otherwise I'll go on too much about all no, this stuff. No, yeah. it's not like that. I mean, it was nice to know, mm -hmm. like, uh, I was just uh, realizing when I was listening to you, how important it was for you to listen to yourself and uh, how uh, doing other things you were not interested in uh, made you realize that no, I don't want this. I'm not doing this. It's it, it's a constant uh, uh, learning about yourself. Like no, I don't want to do this. I don't like this. I mean, what am I doing? I mean, all those things really redirect you towards what you want. Mm -hmm. If, if you are aware. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah I, I find it difficult even to this day to listen to my own intuition because it tells me to do crazy things <laughs> sometimes. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, I haven't, like, I moved to this really nice place where I live. And uh, I was living in a smaller place before. And when this place came up, one of my neighbors, in, in the same building, right? One of my neighbors told me about it. She said, you better quickly call the manager and tell them you want this. And I said, yeah, well, wait. First, I have to find out how much it costs and when I can move and this and that. So I, I prayed and went inside and I was told to just take it no matter what. So when the manager told me how much it was, I thought, no way, I can't, I can't do it. It's, it's too much more money. And again, inside, I was told just to do it. So I did it, you know. And then I told God, look, if you want me to do this, you better, you know, <laughs> you better help me. Because you know? <laughs> otherwise I'm going to fight with you. you know? <laughs> so I, I did it and it was pretty smooth. Now I have much more space now to do my artwork because I, I had a separate studio that I gave up during the pandemic. Um, but this is much bigger now. There are a lot of things like that that we are told to do or we have some sort of inkling that we should do and then it's really hard to trust it. It is. Uh, some people are really good at that. I really admire them. Um, 
But it depends what you are told yes. to do, you know? Yes. Like if, you, if, if I'm told to do something simple, like go buy some groceries, I won't have any <laughs> resistance. <laughs> that is not what your insight or intuition is going to do. <laughs> yeah. But uh, again, uh, I learned like how you listen to what uh, your intuition was or your trust or faith was saying to you and then how you prayed for it. Yeah, and um, this is something uh, that leads me to what we share in common, which is our love for Indian classical music. And that's how we met, right? Uh, here in Vancouver. Um, I think that, that whole thing too came to me quite by accident. You know? Um, it's at a young age I was told to go study with Ashaji, our teacher, and um, I didn't do it because I thought there is no way I can sing like that. You know, I I have been given many gifts, but that's not one of them. <laughs> so I just left it alone. And I was told a number of times by people who were close to the teacher to go study, and I just. I would call her and say I'm coming and then I wouldn't go. I completely left that alone until um, it's been five, six years now, six years ago. Um, one of my friends was studying with her and he loved um, Indian classical music too. And I found myself telling, oh God, I wish I could be there. And he said, would you just come, you know, just come. So somehow I didn't resist it. I said, okay, I'll come. You know, what? So he said, you know, you don't have to sing, just sit there. So I said, are you sure I don't have to sing? <laughs> so I went there and um, I found the whole environment that was so non judgmental that it didn't really matter how bad I sounded or how good I sounded. They so felt very accepted there. And again, that kind of came, it didn't come from the rational mind, you know. Um, I think if you have something inside of you, you like something, eventually it will come and get you, even if it's late in life. Uh, and so you know, then I left, uh, I left my Indian music studies. I didn't start again until earlier this year. And the only reason I started was because uh, this voice inside told me, you know, life is not forever. If you like this, you better start now or never. <laughs> you know? uh, so I started again. And it's, it's so nice. You know, it's, um, I find it really grounding. And it's, again, also a spiritual yes, path, right? It is. It yeah. Is. I remember when I first went for class in 2015, September 22nd, I started my class. Oh, you remember I do, I do. <laughs> uh -huh. So... On the first day, um, you know, they play Tanpura in the class, right? I couldn't sleep yeah. at night. I was like, the Tanpura, oh, yeah. the, the sound of the Tanpura. Oh my God, it was yeah. bugging me so much. I couldn't sleep. I put one pillow, two pillow, earplugs, this, that. I mean, I, I just couldn't sleep. And, and the next day I called my mom and I said, I'm not doing this. I just couldn't sleep because of that. And... Uh, I, I kept listening to that all night, even though there was nobody playing. Uh -huh. All night, you won't believe, all night. I was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, I still hear it. Oh my God, I still hear it. How, how, how can I close my ears? How can I close my ears? It, it bugged me so mm -hmm. much. But then later, I was used to it. <laughs> yeah. It, it was a blessing that you heard that, even though it was bothering you. I think so. Later now, yes. later now, I I feel like, what what was I doing? I mean, how how I mean, was that a good thing that I couldn't sleep, or was it a bad thing? I always I always ask myself like, to listen to that when it was not present, all night long. Even though nothing was playing, everybody was sleeping. I couldn't go to sleep. Mm. 
That's because it was part of you. Probably. Something that something that needed to be I awakened. I told all my yeah. friends. I called them all. Yeah. Believe me. I called them all. <laughs> I told my mom, what is this happening? What is happening with me? I couldn't sleep. Yeah. There was nothing playing in the room. But I could listen to that so loudly. I turned, uh-huh. I turned left, I turned right. I put pillows in my ears. I put earplugs. My mom, my mom was like, okay, you are overreacting. I said, no, I'm not overreacting. I couldn't sleep and that's a big deal. I couldn't sleep. Come on. <laughs> All my friends are like, you are crazy. You don't have to think that much. I'm like, okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so then what, what made you go, go to the class again? Just the routine. The class routine. I just wanted to know how it is going to be the second time. And the third time and the uh-huh. fourth time. Uh-huh. And then I just I just forgot about that experience and then it stayed with me in a peaceful way. Mm. So the second time did it continue that sound? No, I night? slept. I okay. slept but then Yeah, so it, it was just to wake you up. Probably, but it was so it was too much. I mean, it was very disturbing. Big, big things are always like it that. It was very disturbing. I thought I'm not going to class anymore. Because we had class one <laughs> once in a week. I remember that. Yeah, and one yes. of my friends from there, she told me like, there's a music class. Would you like to join? I said, I don't know. I have classical music. I don't know. I like, I like music, but I don't know. They sing it very difficult. In it, I think they, when they sing it, it becomes so difficult that I can't listen to it anymore. Mm-hmm. So I said, no, I don't think I, I'll be able to do that. It is so difficult. Then she said, okay, let's go one time. Let's see how it is. Then I went with her and then I, I sat in, with, in the class and I was listening to everybody. And uh, yeah, it was a very uncomfortable feeling for me for that first night. It was very uncomfortable. Mm. And then when the next wow. week she called and said, are you coming for class? I said, no, I don't think I will be going to class because I couldn't sleep after that class. I don't want to give up my sleep. (laughs) No, no, no. Thank you. (laughs) No, thank you. I need my sleep more than anything. Then she's like, okay, Mm -hmm. let's go. I don't have, I don't have a ride. I need to go with you. I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's see. (laughs) Uh Wow. What an amazing experience. Yes, it was very young. Very, very young. Wow. But don't and then you you really loved it after that. I remember you were taking more than one class a week. <laughs> when I first heard that we are moving to US, you know, yeah. I was super mad. Like, I have to give up my music class. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I, I would be like mm-hmm. sitting in one corner and then I would be thinking like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? How, how am I survive? How, how am I going to survive? Because I keep listening to the class recordings and stuff like that whenever I'm doing something I'm always listening to those Mm -hmm. things I I was like no I can't give up I don't want to give up and then yeah yeah at that time there were no online classes there were no online classes and then uh, yeah it was a lot for me (laughs) (laughs) but it was I'm I'm glad but it was something like uh, I don't know. It's it's a blessing, I would say. Yes, definitely. Yes. I'm I'm glad you have found another teacher. Yes. Now, yes. Where you are. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The first thing I was looking yeah, up think... before moving uh, here is like, uh, where can I find a music class? <laughs> mm. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad to have met you in that context. Yeah, yeah, same for me, you know, yeah. same for me. Like, and and thank you, thank you for translating a lot of Hindi words for me. Did I? I don't know. Uh, did I do something for you? Yeah. Do you remember? I used to give you a piece of paper and say, oh, "Can you write down?" Okay, in the class. Okay, okay. I remember now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, now I I understand most yeah. things, but there's still sometimes there's still words that I don't understand. Um, so yeah, I, I used to pass you a piece of paper and say, well, can you write down what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So eventually I told Asha Ji that I couldn't understand a lot of what she was saying. Yeah. 
and uh, she, she said something in Hindi that I, I can't remember. It was kind of funny. About the bandish? She, you know, she said, no problem, you know, like, because I can't understand. She says, no problem, you'll pick it yeah. up, you know. I was like, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and th then I, I was very envious of all the uh, Indian people who came from East mm. Africa because there, uh, there they grew up speaking uh, Hindi, you know. Um, but where I grew up, there was no such thing. Yeah. Uh, where I grew up, there were mostly Ismailis, and then I think there was uh, one Hindu family, um, and they lived next to us too. And there was one uh, Sikh family, and that was it in terms of Indians. Not many people, like maybe 200 people altogether. Oh. Yeah. But the Indian family that lived close to us in the first house where I grew up, um, I used to hear their pujas and everything. I would climb on our roof to watch oh. them because it was it was so colorful, you know. All the our practices are not colorful. <laughs> like that. So um, I used to climb on the tree, you know, that yeah. jambu tree, so I could watch the, everything. And I think that's where I must have fallen in love with the music or something, uh, and all the bhajans and everything. Probably, probably, because yeah. I, I because you have always listened to what you liked in your childhood mostly. And my mother, my mother really liked uh, um, Hindu things. You know that saint, Mirabai? Yeah. She used to play her songs all oh. the time. It used to drive me crazy at first. I said, Mom, can we listen to something else? <laughs> <laughs> and um, she used to make such a face that I wouldn't say anything then. So she had her cassettes and she would play her, um, her songs. And uh, her voice, it took a bit of getting used to. But then um, I still hear those in my head sometimes. Um, at night, you know, to go to sleep, my mom would read me stories from uh, Hindu mythology, uh, which I didn't really understand. <laughs> <you know. laughs> um, so, yeah, so all those in... You were right what you said earlier, all those influences come together in your path yeah. in life. Yeah. That's what I've learned like so closely, like so clearly, like you have always stayed with your childhood, with your interests, with your likings, and you have listened to yourself. That is so wonderful. I have tried. No, that's what, that's what yeah. I understood from your experience. Like there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong in listening to your own self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, there's only one thing I miss sometimes is the French speaking environment. Yeah. So, but I, I watch in uh, French movies and I listen to the French news. Um, and there are some people here that I know who speak French, but then we are always with other English speakers. So we don't really speak French. Um, so because it, it's, um, it's a culture and language that can be very um, poetic. You know? uh, so sometimes I miss that. Uh, but I, I listen to um, French music a lot, a lot more than Indian music. You must uh, start sharing some French music with me. <laughs> yes, I will. I will send some to you. <laughs> it will be nice to listen to some other music other than English and uh, in Hindi and Indian. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I will definitely send yeah. some to you. Yeah. It was so nice talking to you, knowing about you, knowing about so many things that uh, has moved you, has stayed with you, has transformed you. Thank you so much for having me here and giving me this uh, freedom to just speak freely. Oh my God, you. I really, I really enjoyed talking to you. <laughs> And um, a big hello to your audience. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was really very nice. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for... Uh, uh, and especially uh, to be able to do it today, uh, an auspicious yeah. day. Thank you, for, yeah. Thank you for picking that date. <laughs> Thank you for making yourself available for that day. <laughs> yeah. I asked inside. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, this also you followed your, yeah. your, your intuitions. <laughs> yeah, at first I thought, no, I, I think I want to do it in December. 
And then this voice said, no, no, do it on the 22nd. Wow. And, I, and I said, okay. You know, who am I to argue with? <laughs> <laughs> so wonderful so wonderful yeah so thank you again thank, thank you, you so, so much, much. thank and, you so um, much uh, thank you for being yourself i would like to say every time uh, mm. because being real and being authentic is the real happiness it's not like you know that day when we were talking uh, in the phone when you uh, mm. laughed at something that we were talking about uh, i after hanging up uh i was thinking like i was talking to my mom uh, at lunch like uh, i never heard uh, her laugh during the time i uh, met her in vancouver vancouver never she would just put a pretty smile and i never heard her uh, laughing but it was so nice to hear that do ah. that do that please do that <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know <laughs> that sounded so nice oh my god mm. <laughs> mm. oh, that's really good to know. Yeah, and I I love your laughter. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I, yeah. I, I wish you, I wish you well with all the work you're doing with holistic conversations <laughs> and all the people you have interviewed and will be interviewing. Thank yeah. you so much. I think we all we will all learn something from it. Yeah, uh, the same for me. This experience is uh, mm. totally spiritual for me. Mm. So it's a learning for me as well. Right. Definitely. Great. Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Keep laughing. Keep laughing louder. <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> thank you. Have a Take good care. day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye bye.